friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Got a pretty neat video for you, I believe. This is on building a custom bending iron and table to bend the sides on that custom guitar that I'm building. So this video is closely related to the guitar that I'm building. However, in this particular video, we're not actually gonna be bending the sides. We're gonna be building the tool and then we're going to be practice bending some wood so you'll get to see how that works too. I'm pretty happy with the way this all turned out and I think you're going to enjoy the video. I appreciate you watching. Well I thought it was about time to build myself a good quality bending iron. I looked at the Stumac version. It's $225. They're not cheap to build. I can build one in the neighborhood of a hundred bucks that I think will be every bit as good as the 225 model. Save myself 125 bucks. Not that that's that critical. Why not? I like to make stuff anyway, so it's kind of fun to even try it. So I've got the electronics parts on order that I'm going to uh, use, and I'm going to go ahead and make my block of wood out of this. Um, this is uh, a, about a two inch thick piece of um, sycamore, just a good looking block. Now that I've got most of that cleaned off, this is still quite uh, low here due to the sawmill marks and uh, I'm going to just take it back to the joiner now, now that I have a flat area and I'm just going to lay it on there and cut the rest of this off. It'll be close enough even if it's not perfect because it'll just take it off faster and I have a fine sandpaper on here now and there's no point wearing out the sandpaper. I've settled on about four and a quarter inches, I think square is going to work real good. Now I'm going to glue these two blocks together and I'm going to cross grain them. In other words, the grain is running this way here and the grain is running perpendicular here and I'm going to glue them together that way on purpose. Before I glue them together, I'm going to put these little nails in here so that they won't drift on me. I'll cut them off. Okay, so I will make a little X mark there so I know that that side there goes together. Got my marks lined up, get my nails lined up, get the holes back in there. They're together. And now we'll just slide it in this big vise here. Line them up just a little bit there. The only reason I wanted to go all the way through with that bit is that I'm going to take a hole saw now and let that be my guide for my hole saw. The hole saw has a quarter inch bit also but I didn't want any wandering and I think that'll make that stay straight. I hope it does anyway. I'm only going to be able to go part of the way through with the hole saw uh, each way so that way I can turn it back over and, and do it and I think the holes are going to line up pretty well. If not, I'll put them in my metal lathe and ream this hole and make it smooth, whatever I have to do. And I got a little set up here. I've got this large block back here clamped to the table so it can't move and it's clamped tight. These, This block is flush up against that. Then I put this little small board against the front of it too to keep it. That way it shouldn't be able to spin at all. I shouldn't have to hold it that much, but I, you know, I'll keep my hand on it, but uh, it should make it a lot safer. That's working great except for the fact that that thing is so dull it's just burning its way through. Well, the camera keeps shutting off on me, but anyway, we're going to try from this side. I've already went through the other side. Uh, since I sharpened it, it's cutting much better. Not great, but much better. Well, it appears I'm bottomed out, but I don't think I'm all the way through. Well, I know I'm not all the way through. Yeah, we did bottom out on the other side too, so I can see it there. So it's not going to cut any deeper. 
and I'd say we're within a whisper so I think I, I bet I can tap that out of there so that's what I'm gonna try to do I think I can feel it springing so I don't think it's very thick I think it's pretty pretty thin I'm just gonna give it a good wrap there it went right on through so yeah I knew it had to be right at that last little bit I'll just take a file and knock that out This hole's about a, a quarter inch all the way around, bigger than the tubing that I bought. I bought two inch tubing, outside diameter. And this is a two and a half inch hole, or supposed to be. So a quarter inch all the way around. And I think I'm gonna fill that gap with plaster of Paris or some other plaster type material that won't transfer the heat as well. I'm just going to round over lightly these sharp corners. Okay, I think that might be all I can do until I get the uh, rest of the materials. Well, that looks like a really nice uh, block there. I think that's going to serve our purposes perfectly. I've got this piece of stainless steel pipe chucked up into the lathe here. I have an indicator on it here. My goal is I'm going to cut it off at this spot right here, this black mark. I'm going to cut it off there, but you know, I, so I got it close, chucked up close to this end for the cut. If I put the cut way out here, it'd be way unstable. Even here, it's going to be unstable. What I'm doing now is I've got an indicator on here, and I'm spinning this to make sure, you know, when I cut this off, I want to make sure it's straight. So look at, look how far off this is. You think it's straight in the chuck, but it's not. I'm spinning the pipe in the vise, and you can see the indicator dial moving a lot. It's not quite a hundred thousandths movement, but it's moving quite a bit. A hundred thousandths would be a tenth of an inch or about two and a half millimeters. The goal is, is to, when you spin it, that the indicator doesn't move much at all, if any. So right there's the high spot, and that means that the pipe is too close to the indicator on this side. So, you know, what I want to do is try to move the indicator back to about where the center would be, and that's roughly around the uh, 30,000 mark there. It's just a guess right now. So now I'm moving it there now it, now I would think the indicator will move about half as much as it did before or less see how little it's moving now compared to the way it did move so that pipe is much straighter in that chuck than it was before so again we're gonna go to the high spot which is right there and try to move it about halfway between where it was moving and I'm just eyeballing it at this point about right there I think is going to be close. Now it's just moving a couple of thousandths. That's all it is. It's just a couple of thousandths. That's less than a human hair. And you got to keep in mind that's 12 inches long so it's from where it's connected back there out to here it's probably 11 inches to right there. So that's only moving a couple thousandths in 11 inches. That's pretty straight. Let's go ahead and set up to cut this off and I've never tried to cut stainless steel before, stainless steel pipe, and I don't have very good equipment for cutoffs. I tell you, that's the hardest thing there is for me to do on this lathe. So more than likely, I'm not going to get this cut off with this lathe. I'll just score it and then take it over to a bandsaw, and at least I'll have a good straight line. Yeah, that's not going to cut it off. I already know that, but uh, and I'm not going to keep pushing it because I'll just cause a problem. At least I have a good straight line now all the way around there. There's other ways I could have done that. I could have wrapped a piece of paper around it and got a straight line, but, you know, that gives you a really good straight line. You can't hardly beat that. I cut this off in the bandsaw, and it didn't do very good. You might be able to see that I got over my uh, laziness, and I put my steady rest on here and that helps uh, to hold it really steady. It holds it three points out here with brass, and 
Now I can turn it on and cut this end and it shouldn't move on me much. That stuff's hard. I've almost got it perfectly flat, but not quite. And the inside just got a burr, so I'm going to clean up the inside. I've never really worked with stainless before, and it's not an easy thing to work with. You know, and I, this is a lightweight lathe, guys. You should realize that. This is not a heavy-duty lathe. You know, if you had the heavy-duty stuff where you could just force it in there, it'd be no problem at all. About got it, I think. Still not quite like I wanted. I wanted it perfectly smooth on that inside because I'm going to force aluminum down through there. See if this will work a little better. I think that might have done it. Yeah, I think that did it. Yeah, I got rid of the lip there. You got to make use of the tools you got. And, and I, you know, this is a much better than no lathe. There's no question. But it is a very lightweight lathe in comparison to, you know, a, a machine shop lathe. Assuming that I get these clips stuck together in the right sequence, <laughs> you just saw me cut off my steel stainless steel pipe and you square the end of it up. Now here's why that's important. You would think, well, it's going to be down in this block anyway, so what difference does it make? Well, that's exactly the reason it makes a difference. You know, assuming I'm going to put this all together on a real flat surface like this for mica, you know, I can set this block down on here. I know it's flat and level. I set this pipe down on here. I know it's perfectly flat and level. Even though it was out three thousandths and eleven inches, it, now it's you know, only eight and a half inches long or something like that. So that even cuts the error off a little bit more. It may be only off two thousandths of an inch from the one end to the other now. The point is, now I can set this on the table, I can set this on the table, and I know I have an equal gap all the way around here because everything's square and flat. Now, why is that important? And the reason that's important is I'm going to fill this gap with plaster of Paris to act like a heat sink or an, uh, an insulation from the wood so the wood doesn't get real, real hot. And that'll hold this in there really good, I think. And of course, that's a test and it, the heat might break it out later. And, you know, I could always try a different kind of cement, you know, like refractory cement or something like that made for heat. But I think the plaster of Paris will work. It says it's good for up to 1,200 degrees, and we're not going to even get close to that, I don't think. This is my first attempt at doing this. Never tried it before. I've only watched a video or two online that people have made similar ones, and they didn't make it like this. So, you know, we'll see how it works. Uh, I think I got a problem. I was going to put this aluminum in this pipe, but it don't go. That's because the aluminum is the exact same outside diameter as this is. So the aluminum's two inches. I want this to go inside of this pipe. And then the reason I want that, you know, is to take up the space for one thing. And then I can drill a hole that's exactly the right size for my heater to go into. And let me show you what the heater looks like. This is a uh, cartridge heater that I purchased from McMaster Car and it's a 110 heater it's 200 watts so what I need to do is drill a 3 8 inch hole in this and then force and then put this inside that hole this will heat up heat up this pipe and we're all good now that's in theory you know I know this is going to heat at a different rate than the stainless steel I know that but you know like it's it's better sometimes to just be ignorant and just hope for the best and that's what we're doing here you know so if it works it works if it don't work then you know I've tried this and spent the time in error and I'll learn something you can see I have this piece of aluminum chucked up in the lathe I have a live center on this end here it keeps it from moving this way and it this spins inside of this housing here anyway I, I also indicated this in so I had it in real straight I drilled a little hole in there so that the center would be perfectly in line and now I'm just taking my first roughing pass and I'm only going to go down six inches or so about six inches because I don't need the full length of this to go inside the tube just about six inches at the end of the tube that will also keep the heat away from the wood a little bit more so here's what it looks like cutting this off of here Now we know we have an almost perfectly round cylinder. 
We're going to do some measurements now to see how far we need to take this down to fit it inside that tube. To cut this down accurately, you have to measure accurately the inside of this hole. I have these hole gauges. They go inside of here like so, and then you they expand out to the, to the uh, size of the pipe, and then you can lock them in out here. And I've done that here and, and checked it very carefully, and as you can see, it just fits in there perfectly. Then I've measured this with a micrometer, and I get one inch, 865 thousandths. I measured it with an actual micrometer, then I double checked it with these calipers just as a sanity check because I'm used to reading the calipers, and I wanted to make sure I didn't misread the micrometer. Well, I'm glad I did do that because I did misread the micrometer. One inch, 865 thousandths. I, I read the micrometer 75 thousandths, and now that I think about it, I know how I misread the micrometer. I know I, I know I misread the micrometer, but I'll double check the micrometer. Anyway, it is uh, one inch, 865 thousandths. Like I said, I don't read the micrometers that often, and that's why I double checked it there. I'm actually getting one inch, 864 thousandths with this, and this is more accurate. So that's what we're going to go for. I'm going to write that down, one inch, 864 thousandths. I have it down to about 874 thousandths at this end. It's about an, a thousandths less at this end. So we need to be 864, so that's 10 thousandths to come off. I've dialed in 4 thousandths on one side. That means that it takes 8 thousandths off the total diameter. I've also slowed the feed down so that it'll be a very smooth cut. I'm going to stop it right there and double check it to see where we're at. I'm showing 62 thousandths right there, so it looks like I'm cutting too deep. Glad I stopped it. Double, double check it with my calipers. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cutting too deep. I can't believe it. Glad I checked it. I'm going to double check it here now. Yeah, I'm actually a little big now, but that's okay. I'm going to just go with that for the moment. All right, let's see where we're at here and see if we're anywhere close. 66 thousandths here, and we needed 64, so that's two thousandths bigger, and that might be enough. That might be okay. And about 68 thousandths on that side there. So that's about four thousandths too big there. What I'm going to do is just take a file. I mean four thousandths of an inch is not much, trust me. By the way, this is hot, so I sh it probably will cool down and be smaller. I should have thought of that. So maybe I won't even file this until it cools down. It may be that I've already gone under my size because it's definitely hot. Well, I'm glad I let that cool off, and I actually cooled it off with some cold water and rags. We're still about a thousandth and a half bigger than I want here. We're just about right on on this end. So we're still a little large on this end, and that's just because the lathe turns a slight taper, which, you know, is not very much. For a hobby lathe or whatever you want to call this, uh, that's pretty good, really. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time getting it that accurate. So I'm just going to take a file and knock that last thousandth or so off uh, and see what I can do with that. And I'd say we're about a half a thousand strong yet, but that, that's pretty darn good. I mean, a half a thousand isn't much. I'm just going to go over it very lightly with the file one more time. More or less, just to knock off any high ridges. I'm tapering the corner down a little bit, so it'll be an easier start inside the tube. What my plan is, is to force this aluminum piece that deep into here. This part that's left over will be in the wood. The heater will be up inside of this piece, up through the bottom. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm also going to turn a smaller section here that will be for mandolin sides right on the end of this. An inch and a half is what I presently have, which I think is just a hair too big for mandolin sides. So I'm going to turn this down to about an inch and three eighths. So now we're going to take it out of the lathe, turn it around, and work on this end. I got everything turned around, chucked up in the lathe here, uh, centered, all that good stuff. And now I put a mark right here that you can't see that's a little bit more than an inch and a half long. So for the most part, I'm, I'm going to turn this whole thing here down to an, you know, this, this inch and a half is a little bit wider than a set of mandolin sides. And I'm going to turn it down to about an inch and three-eighths diameter. First thing I'm going to do is make a mark where I'm cutting it off. That's the hardest thing that I do on this lathe is do cutoffs. Uh, it for whatever reason, and I'm just not that good at it, so it just it's really hard to cut them off. I'm going to go ahead and cut that off the rest of the way on the bandsaw, turn that in flat, recenter it, and then we'll turn this rest of this down. Got her all set up, and we started our first pass here, and that's what it looks like. Okay, this measurement here is not critical really at all. It's just a number I'm making up in my head. We're at over 600 thousandths, one inch 600 thousandths, which is still way over an inch and a half. So I want to be below that for sure. So we're still plenty good. Got to be pretty close. I've decided off in my mind I'm going to go to the full one and three eighths which is one and three seven five so we've got about fifteen thousandths to go to get there I'm dialing in six thousandths that'd be a twelve thousandths off of it and actually I'm going to change the feed rate to get a smoother finish now it's going to feed very slowly and put a, you know, a fairly nice finish I hope Now I'm going to try to break these corners. This corner is going to be exposed, so I'm going to cut this one a little bit more. I'd like to cut this end flush. Um, with that much stick out, it's unlikely it's going to work. So I'm just going to try to cut really, really light cuts and see if we can do it without having to put the steady rest on. It's almost cleaned up. There's just a little bit left. I think that turned out real nice. Um, you know, it's very hot, so it, the measurement won't be perfectly accurate, but it's close. So we're at 370 thousandths, a little bit even smaller than that, which is fine. I, you know, I would rather have it a little small because I think that uh, this needed to be a little smaller for some of the tight mandolin bins. We got a little bit of a burr right here on this yet, so I'm just going to take a file and clean that up. Very smooth, very clean now. That's going to be a really nice piece. You want to talk about close tolerances. Well, you know, I'm not that great of a machinist. I just do what I do. But, you know, the, you know, I, I told you, or if you saw on the film there, that I started cutting this and I got it just a hair too small. Well, look, it, it, that part fits in there. And it just fits in there. And then, then where I left it bigger, you know, it, you'd have to press it, see? So that's perfect. That is absolutely perfect because that way now I can press it in there and there's no way you're going to get this apart once I get that pressed down in there. So I mean it just 
it, I'm just so glad I stopped before I cut the whole thing that small, smaller size. It's just about the perfect size for a good tight press fit. And we'll press fit it all the way in up to this shoulder so that it just that little small part is sticking out of the top. I'm drilling the hole out to put the heater up inside there and uh, I've test drilled with several drill bits till I found one that was really tight and uh, that's what I'm looking for. So here we go. Okay, we got about three quarters of an inch to go and we're out of drill bit. We got about a, oh, five eighths of an inch to go, maybe if that much. We might just have to drill it from the other end and uh, make the holes meet up and there'll just be a hole in the other end that I could cap off or something. Got it turned around. I've recentered it with the dial indicator so it's running perfectly true. I should be able to, in theory, go straight into that other hole. It shouldn't be any problem. I think we're through. Boy, that was simple. Not. Let's see if it goes this way through. Why is that like that? That's weird. That's weird. I think there's little burrs getting tore out inside these things. There you go. Now it goes all the way through. Unfortunately, it's too easy to get it all the way through. That's not what I was wanting, but it just is what it is. I can tell you one thing for sure. It won't be any problem in this thing conducting heat because it gets so hot you can hardly hold on to it, just drilling the holes and things like that. So that's not going to be a problem. Well, I feel like I've got everything ready to go. I, was, I don't want to press this in here before I'm ready, but I think I can go ahead and press this in here now. This is a long, tall pressing process here. You can see that I have a big jack at the top. I built this press myself. It's got these garage door springs that lift it back up. And you know, you can see here, this is the plunger that's gonna push. And down below, I have the piece of aluminum that's gonna get pressed into the stainless steel pipe here. Let's start pressing and see what happens. Should be fairly simple and fairly straightforward. I would imagine some of the aluminum will just get brushed off here if it's too tight. But it'll go because this is 30 tons of pressure and it'll push it through there. I'm not worried about that part. And it, I do see it shaving off aluminum as we go in here. But that's okay. At least it'll be tight and it won't come out. It might be that I've hit the length of my jack. I think I have. So I need to raise everything up to uh, push some more. Okay, all I did to uh, raise it up is I just put it on a bigger block of wood, raised everything up that way. I mean, I could have adjusted the whole table, but that's heavy and this is easy, so that's all I'm doing. Just putting stuff under it to make it be higher so that the stroke will be long enough. And here we go. I can always cut that off on the lathe if I don't like it. That's pretty close. That's pretty darn close. You can see there how I pressed it in. And uh, now it's really one solid piece. It's not going anywhere and it's heavy. Trust me, that's really heavy now. We're at that magical moment where we're ready to put the plaster in here. I cleaned the table off really clean first with a straight with a razor blade to make sure there wasn't any lumps or anything on the table. Scraped it all down. Then uh, clamped the block down to the table so that nothing could sleep, you know, lift up and, and slide out from underneath it. 
Then I took these little wedges and wedged this down in there uh, so that it's centered in the hole. And as best I can tell, it's pretty centered. Now we're going to pour plaster of Paris down in these open slots areas. And once the plaster, get enough plaster of Paris in there, then I'll pull the wedges out and fill the rest of it. At least that's the plan. I haven't mixed up plaster of Paris since I was a little kid in, in grade school. What I remember was that it got really hard. Um, I know it's basically the same thing as drywall mud. But, you know, at least back then, and I don't know, they've probably changed the formula since then. At least back then, it got very, very hard. And that's what I'm trying to see if we can get that to happen here. I'll be disappointed if it turns out to be soft like drywall mud. But it probably will be. Complete shock and disappointment. When I turned this over, the stuff didn't even make it halfway through. I thought it was falling down in there and was filling it up completely wrong. So, I have mixed it up really soupy this time and I'm going to pour it down in there and with hopes that it's going to get down in there, but to be honest, it doesn't even look like it's going to go down in there this way. So, I'm going to force it down in there. Man, but I do have it really thin now. I doubt I got all the voids filled. In fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't, but I think it's going to be strong enough to do what I want to do and if it's not we'll know it pretty quickly anyway and therefore we'll just do something different. I'm going to drill the hole, this is the pilot hole for the cord and I'm just eyeballing to the center here, I don't know. That drilled easier than I was expecting. Now I'm going to enlarge the hole to the size of the cord. I've got it, the cord is about a quarter inch. This is. The next bigger 1760 force, I think it is. I deburred the inside of the hole with a Dremel tool. Now let's see if this will feed through here by any with any stretch of luck. And it seems to. And maybe that's premature because probably need to feed this through up in there and I'm not sure how I'm going to anchor that. I think I'm going to get some of that uh, heat resistant uh, engine silicone and put around this end of it and poke it up in there and just let it stay up in there like that. I have this high temperature Permatex uh, RTV silicone gasket maker. It uh, The end is clogged up it's pretty old, so I just cut a hole in the side of the thing. I tried to open it the other way. I couldn't get it open. I'm just going to put it around this end, and we'll just hope for the best. Once that sets up and gets hard, we'll do the rest of the wiring. I've got the two hot wires connected and I have a ground wire left over. Uh, I, I didn't run it through the hole here this first time just as a test. I wanted to make sure it was going to work. And I'm not even going to bother with the ground wire just for the test. I'm just going to make sure that when I plug it in it starts to get hot. If I feel it getting hot then I'll turn it off and you know as long as we don't see any sparks fly I guess we're good. Okay, it's plugged in. I'm feeling it here to see how long it takes to feel heat. And at the moment, I feel nothing. It's probably going to take a little while to get through all that, but that aluminum heats up pretty fast, so I would think it would heat up. It's not cold now, but I'm wondering if that's just my hands warming it up. 
Yeah, it's starting to warm up now. I can feel it. it. Didn't do it as fast as I expected. I expected it to be faster than that. But I guess that's good. Yeah, it's getting warm now. I can tell it's definitely heating up. Just going to leave it on there just long enough to about where I can tell it's really hot. It's still pretty. I mean, it's definitely past room temperature by quite a bit now. I'm guessing it's past body temperature by quite a bit. I would say it's probably in the 115 or 20 degree range, maybe a little warmer than that. They say these don't work very good for this, but I'm going to try it anyway. Because of the reflective surface, they say it doesn't work very well. It says 85 degrees, 86 degrees. That's Fahrenheit, of course. I'm sure it's warmer than that. Yeah, it's, it's quite a bit warmer than that. I don't know why it doesn't pick up better than that. It's getting pretty hot. It's, it's hot enough now that you wouldn't want to leave your hand on it very long. I'm going to unplug it. Let it cool off, so at least that proves that it works. Now we'll wire it up the correct way and put the ground onto the uh, metal here. I'm just going to put a wire tie around the insulation of this a little ways from the end there, and I'm going to tighten it up really tight. I'm actually going to put two of them on there, and the only reason I'm doing that is to keep it from pulling back through the hole. I don't have the tool for tightening these. I know there's a special tool for it, but when you don't have a tool, you just do it the best way you can. That's pretty tight, so I think that'll work. And that'll keep it from pulling back through the hole then, like that, and that's all that's for. I'm going to make up my uh, grounding plug lug here for the ground. I have, I'm crimping these together, and then I have heat heat shrink uh, tape to go over it. And just for the record, you can see I have a ground screw in there and I have the green wire with a eyelet screwed to that. So it's all grounded. You know, I wouldn't say it's UL rated, but uh, it's pretty good. Well friends, I was trying to figure out a good way that I could check the temperature on my side bender here and I found, I think, the perfect way. This meter, uh, you know, has a temperature probe and I'm holding it between my thumb and first finger. It says I'm 97.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which 98.6 is perfect or it would be normal body temperature and you never get normal body temperature between your fingers anyway so that's probably very accurate so 97.4 it looks like now that's Fahrenheit let's see what it says on Celsius on Celsius it says about 36.3 something like that my friends in millimeter land will have to know if that's right or not because I don't know <laughs> without looking it up. I know I can Google it, guys. I know that. <laughs> so anyway, this seems to be very accurate. So I'm putting it back on Fahrenheit because that's the only thing that means anything to me because I'm just not familiar with Celsius at all. I like to call it centigrade. Where did that, when did that leave? I mean, there used, years ago, I remember things being referred to as centigrade. Whatever. I guess I'm dating myself. Okay, I the way I have this designed you know, I could just plug this cord directly into the outlet and it would heat up and it would probably be fine, except it would probably just keep getting hotter and hotter and get too hot. This is a um, router speed controller is really what it amounts to. And it's got a uh, grounded plug here that I'm... These are sold at Harbor Freight. I bought this one just off of eBay and it looks exactly like the one they sell at Harbor Freight. So got it a little cheaper there off of eBay. So I've got... I've got my bender plugged into that. I, uh, I haven't plugged this in yet, and I'm just holding the probe against the metal. 91.4, looks like it's slowing way down, 91.6. All right, we're gonna call that close enough. Now that's, that's Fahrenheit, let's see, Celsius, that works out to 32.5 it looked like, but let's double check that here. 32.4, I don't know, we're in that ballpark. 
Okay, just to give you a, a, a basis of starting, that's the two options is variable and full. And I've got it on variable and I've got it rotated all the way to the lowest point. So I'm going to plug it in and see if we notice any temperature change. Here's again in Fahrenheit. Climbing rapidly, it's 120. I've got a large piece of Formica here, countertop, and the I wanted to drill it exactly in the center, and I could cut this down and make it where it would drill in the center, but I just don't feel like cutting it down. Um, I'm just going to worry about center going this way, and that's pretty close to center this way. It's going to be closer to one side than the other. That might even be an advantage. This is the way we're going to drill it. Here we go. Well, I went and bought a brand new bit thinking that would be easier cutting. You know, I see people on YouTube all the time cutting with these things, and they cut through steel, they cut through everything. I have yet to find one that'll cut through butter. I think you can see I have the uh, bending iron stuck through the hole that I just drilled. And what I'm going to do now is mark it on here and I'm going to route out most of the thickness of this. And the idea is that this top will sit down over this, keep this from spinning when I route this cavity out. You're not going to be able to see much on this, but I'm going to route out this square. I've got this bit set to a depth that's about an eighth less than the thickness of this top. Well, I believe that ought to do it. I uh, elected to just hog out the corners rather than chisel them out because it's not going to matter. I just want these sides to be there to keep the thing from sliding around. Mark here, that's where the cord goes, so I know I keep it in the same orientation. There you can see that it fits uh, inside there. It goes down inside there pretty good. It's got a little bit of slop in it. I, we could always fill that with something if we need to, if that causes a problem. I don't think it will. Now I'm going to try to make a base that comes out flush with this so that this sits on the table and the base sits on the table and everything's flush. I cut out some 2 by material down here and this is sitting on it. It's two and a half inches which just makes this fit in there pretty tight. I've got a one inch overhang on this side and now I'm going to uh, drill and screw it down. We're going to plug it in now and see where we're at on temperature and all that good stuff. I did a little slide upgrade to uh, this to anchor it in here. I didn't like the play, so um, I glued this strip to the top here, or underside of the top, and I glued this strip to the underside of the top, and then I put two screws in it. So all I have to do is take out these screws and these screws, and this will lift straight out. So it still comes apart but it's much, much more solid now than it was. It doesn't move at all now. We've got it. I'm pretty excited about this. I'm not going to bend any sides on it yet. I don't think that would be the prudent thing to do without really kind of testing it out pretty well to kind of know what I'm getting into. I've had it plugged in here with it on off, uh, you know, just to make sure that that off works and it's not getting warm at all, so I think we're good. I'm going to I've got it turned all the way down. I'm going to turn it up to variable. Seems like when I did that, I started hearing a slight hum, and that may be in my computer. Yeah, when I turn that off, I quit hearing the hum. It's a very faint hum. Um, it may be in my computer. I'm not really sure. But obviously, that switch is working. It's doing something because you can hear it. And I've got my hand on this to feel when it gets uh, warm. In case you're wondering, there's, uh, there's your uh, metric and your uh, standard ruler there. And there's the height right across there. So maybe you can see where it's coming across there. 
that would be about there's about five and five eighths stick out here which is about uh, 14 and a half centimeters 14 and 14.3 probably 143 millimeters I guess you'd say so we're up you know it's sticking up there to this shoulder and then this top part is another inch and three quarters uh, which is about um, 43 millimeters something like that and it's starting to warm up very slightly uh, I've got it turned all the way down on this and I can feel it warming up slightly it's just a little bit warmer than maybe it's not even body temperature yet it's pretty close it's probably just above body temperature now and in case you're wondering the table is right at 30 inches by 20 inches and as I mentioned my drill press wouldn't drill center so my holes off set here I'm a lot further from the edge right here this is ten and a half inches to the uh, to the metal and that's seven and a half inches and there's two inches right here I drilled a two inch hole so this is sticking through a two inch hole because it is a two inch pipe and I wanted that to be a tight fit on purpose I could have made that a little bit of I mean I don't think it would hurt if there was room around it but I kind of wanted it there to help it be stable uh, you know I think if it had a little room around it that might be a good thing too uh, for heat or whatever but I think it's fine like this and I'm going to try it like this I don't think this for Michael will have any problem with the heat although I could be wrong um, I bought this for mica piece it's just a sink cutout from the local cabinet shop they charged me just one dollar for it well everything's working pretty well I'm a little disappointed in this thing here this uh, you know according to the internet these work for this purpose but it's not really doing a whole lot for me um, I've got it on the lowest setting possible and it's up to 201 degrees now it's probably been on for 15 minutes or more uh, it's taken it quite a while to get to 200 degrees I was hoping it would level off on the lowest thing at around 150 degrees so I may have to come up with a different method to to control the temperature we're at 202 right now which is roughly 95 degrees Celsius I'm going to check up here on the top now to see what it's up here at the on the mandolin part and that's about the same 205 206 it's climbing up to 206 it's going up to 207 it looks like yep it's going to hit 207 here there's 207 that so this it's really odd that the heater only exists in this section right here but this part here seems to be just the same temperature which is really good I, I'm glad that's the case but I didn't expect that yeah it just keeps going up I was really hoping it would not keep going up well that's what I have this thing here is not making me real happy it's a possibility that this one's defective I mean it's made in China you know it's it is what it is I only paid fifteen dollars for it you get what you pay for I know all that you don't have to tell me there was a couple of people that were using these on the internet for this purpose and theirs seemed to work better than this they were able to control the temperature at about 180 well as you can see this is my first attempt at bending sides that was not done on this it was not done on this it was done both my old method and that's why I went to the trouble of building this I have never broken sides before but these broke and I don't know why uh, with my old method but I thought you know what I've always wanted to try this other method so that's why I went ahead and spent the time and energy to build this I will say that I probably had these sides too thick that's probably one of the problems 80 thousandths is about the norm but this Paduke it needs to be a little thinner than that and I think these are at a about 82 thousandths so I probably should have had it about 72 thousandths and I'd probably been a lot better off so I, I made a set of new sides for the guitar and they're 72 thousandths or 70 thousandths I can't remember now but anyway they're they're thinner than these this piece here is still plenty good that could be used for a back and so is this one so I'm just going to cut them off about right here where the break is and I'm going to play with bending these ends here to see if I can do anything with that 
It's been sitting a little while, so I'm going to see what the temperature is now before I start bending, because I figured that wetting it down, it's going to cool this off, and I just want to see where it's at hot. It's jumping way up there fast. It must be pretty hot. 237 already, 238, 239, 240, 241, 250. It hit for a second, back down to 247. So we're in that neighborhood. I'm going to spritz this with water and see if I can do anything with this. It's, uh, it's definitely steaming the wood for sure. Well, that doesn't seem to be doing very much, to be perfectly honest with you. It's bending it, but it's not bending it very, very quickly at all. Well, I'm trying to make another little invention here. You can see it's a piece of tin. This just came out of the side of a tin can. I put my handles on here, and I'm going to see if that will spread out the tension and hold the steam in and make this bend better. You know, I got nothing to lose here. If it breaks, it breaks. So I'm just gonna give it a shot. It's This is thicker now, keep in mind, than what I will be bending. So let's just give it a shot and see if this makes a difference. I do this on the mandolins and it works, but I don't know if it's gonna work on this. I've, I've been letting this cool off for a while too, so this isn't as hot as it was. So I might have to wait till it heats up again. Let me double check the temperature and see where we're at. Looks like it's in the 150 range at the moment. It's coming up, but very slowly. So maybe I'm just jumping the gun here up to 160. So we're gonna have to give it a little bit of time and let it get a little warmer again. We're about 180 degrees Fahrenheit and we're at about 82.8 Celsius. So we're gonna try that. I saw one guy he was recommending the temperature of 180 and that's where we're at right about now so let's just see if that helps anything i think that's a little low myself i think it's got to be hotter than that i'm i actually wonder if his thermometer was very accurate that's what i begin to wonder because i think he was getting some steam and i don't think you're going to get steam at 180. anyway i'm trying this we're going to see what it does I don't think you're going to bend these things very well until you get steam. So, to me, you're not going to get steam until you get it up there around the boiling temperature, around 240, somewhere in there. We were getting that a while ago, but we're not getting that now. So, I think I'm going to uh, wait a little bit longer because I don't see much difference there at that temperature. We're roughly around 210. Fahrenheit about 99 Celsius roughly so uh, let's see what happens now it's steaming now a little bit I'm going to try to keep it there till it gets pretty dry and see if it'll hold that bend pretty good it's going to come back, I know, but we're starting to get something there now. Well, at least I think that's proof enough that it's going to work now. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you uh, learned something there. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.